might be a few more coming, but I think we'll make a start and uh, with a, a large number here. It's a very great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight. Arthur McTavish uh, is a student of this medical school from the Rising Stars uh, and uh, also um, a budding medical historian, among many other talents. Uh, so his topic tonight, which he's been researching, uh, is uh, surgery calls art to its aid. Kind of uh, a catchy topic to, uh, we're not quite sure what he's going to talk about, but uh, we look forward to it with much pleasure. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, hi everybody, um, welcome and thanks so much for coming to this uh, talk that I've prepared for you guys today. Um, I've been really excited for this for quite a long time, as um, I'm sure my friends family and flatmates are as well because this is the last that we have to hear about it. <laughs> um, yeah, I figured the best way to open this up would be to just um, explain how exactly I got into this situation of, of uh, giving a, um, a talk on medical history. And um, in medicine we've got this tutorial called Integrated Cases and last year Terry Doyle was my cases student. <coughs> And as some of you are probably aware, Terry is a really big fan of medical history. And attitude to catch up, um, where I made the terrible mistake of telling that I was also a big fan of medical history. And come on. Um, so I sat down and I told him that I was a big fan of medical history. And he said, well, we run this club where on the last Thursday of every month we get these lectures where on medical history and um, you should come along. And I said, great. Um, and then the next, uh, the next last Thursday of the month that I had free, I went along. I sat down and uh, Terry walks up to me and says, maybe we could get you along to do one of this and that. So I went home uh, after lecture and just lying in bed up at night thinking because uh, I had an idea. A couple months beforehand, um, I stumbled across an article on the internet of a surgeon, um, about a surgeon called Archibald McIntyre, who was a surgeon who, uh, a plastic surgeon operating in World War II, um, working for the RAF. And uh, he operated for fighter pilots, on fighter pilots in the Battle of Britain. And what these fighter pilots would do is, uh, for better maneuverability and visibility within the air, they would, um, they had like these oxygen masks and these gloves, which they'd often take off. Um, yeah, just so like they could see around the cockpit a bit better. And then when these uh, planes got shot, uh, they caught on fire, and they, the pilots got these very characteristic burns on the hands and face. And what, um, uh, Macedon noticed as the surgeon responsible for treating these burns was that uh, the fighter pilots that crashed into the sea ended up uh, doing better in their recovery than the fighter pilots that crashed into land. And using, like, in my opinion, quite a really cool um, amount of surgical and um, clinical, uh, I think, reasoning and observation was that the salt water was the thing that had a factor in the treatment. So, um, he used this and um, started using saline as the treatment for burns within his hospital. And I thought this was really cool. And what I thought was actually equally as cool was the fact that not only was he a Kiwi, this is not, it's a, he was a Kiwi, but not only was he a Kiwi, he was Dunedin born. And not only was he Dunedin born, he was actually um, studying medicine at the University of Otago. And I was like, I studied medicine at the University of Otago. <laughs> This, this is so cool, and um, yeah, I spent the next couple of days um, like showing my friends ears off about it, and so like, yeah, cool. But um, it's, it's it's something that I really just wanted to tell people about. And so um, when the next day I had this, uh, so the day after the lecture, I went to Terry and I said, "This is the thing that I want to do to talk." And um, he said, "Great, I'll pencil you in for next year." Hello? Is that better? Yeah. Fantastic. Um, so I got away to research it, and uh, my uncle ended up, uh, my uncle Joe Ginty ended up giving me this book uh, called Reconstructing Faces by Murray Meikle. And uh, this book focused on these four pioneers in plastic surgery, all um, with a type in New Zealand. 
uh, Sir Harry Gillies and Henry Pickerel, who uh, started operating the First World War, and Arthur McIndoe and Ransom Mallon, who um, started working just before and then continued throughout the Second World War. And uh, Gillies and McIndoe, while not only being uh, uh, Kiwis and Dunedin born, they were actually related. Uh, first cousins once removed to the same uh, <coughs> grandfather or great grandfather, John Gillies. Uh, Malum uh, was from Auckland, but um, he was also a graduate of the University of Otago. And um, Pickerel was a Brit, but a a he actually uh, moved over to New Zealand in um, the early 1900s to become the first dean of the dental school. And yeah, like um, I read this book and I, I thought it was awesome and there were so many aspects from it and stories that I wanted to come along and tell today. But I figured that if I was going to start with the story, I needed to start from the start. And the story starts with uh, Sir Harold Gillies because he's the man who um, most people credit as being the pioneering, pioneering figure and the founding father of plastic surgery. He is to plastic surgery what Rutherford is to physics. And yeah, that's what I thought we'd delve into a little bit today. Uh, plastic surgery, it's, um, while, while Gillies was the founding father or um, the, the person that turned it into an art, uh, sorry, into a surgical specialty in its own right, the techniques pra uh, practiced uh, within it extend back thousands of years. Uh, the words uh, plastic comes from the Greek uh, plasticus mold and that, I think, um, ties in very well to its definition, which is uh, the first thing, like I just Googled it, and I liked the first thing I ripped off Google, which was the process of reconstructing or repairing parts of the body by the transfer of tissue, either in the treatment of the injury or for cosmetic reasons. And um, the, the first instance of this ever um, like, uh, turning up in the historical literature is um, texts that come from uh, uh, 600 uh, BC India. The Indian surgeon um, Shushruta, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, um, the, um, wrote in the, um, the ancient Adurvaic uh, text, the Shushruta Samhita, the process of reconstructing the nose um, after it had been chopped off in battle by um, tissue that had been grafted from the face uh, onto the nose. And um, this continued for like 2,000 years in the Indian subcontinent, uh, being practiced in isolation, and the West wasn't really aware of it until in the 1700s, surgical observers went to uh, India and saw this and brought it back to Britain. Um, it took a while for the Renaissance, uh, for the Western world to actually catch up to this, but in the um, uh, 1597, the um, Italian surgeon Gaspare Taligosi um, did the, the same kind of thing of uh, uh, reconstructing the nose of a soldiers and um, that had been fighting in combat, but also practicing fencing using tissue grafted from the sorry, grafted from the arm <coughs> onto the nose. Um, and then by the time that you get to the 18th century, uh, the 1800s, the 19th century in Europe. Um, there were like plenty of surgeons practicing these techniques of uh, taking tissue from one area of the body and grafting it to the other for the purposes of um, reconstruction. But these were just procedures carried out by surgeons that were acting in isolation, um, operating without the guidance of surgical principles, uh, with no kind of um, formal clinical or academic training. And um, it took the vision of Harold Gillies in World War I in order to turn it into a medical specialty in its own right. So, this guy, Harold Gillis, uh, born in um, 1882 at Transit House Dunedin, which is actually uh, just around the corner from here, uh, at 44 Park Street. Uh, it's called Transit House because uh, uh, Harold Gillies' father, Robert Gillies, um, while being a High Court judge and um, at one point a member of Parliament, was also a keen amateur and astronomer and observed the transit of Venus from an observatory that he had built into the top of his house. Today it's just um, serving as some um, reasonably overpriced and quite cold student flats. <laughs> and, but I think it's quite cool because you get the opportunity to live in a historic castle, but yeah. Um, uh, Gillies himself uh, attended primary school um, over in the UK, but then um, he returned back to New Zealand uh, to attend Wanganui Collegiate in the Upper North Island. 
and um, here he just got this reputation for just being annoyingly good at everything. He was um, sorry. He was a um, renowned golfer and um, a renowned cricketer because um, he won uh, best uh, young New Zealand cricketer of the year um, while studying there, and um, uh, he won gold me uh, medals in mathematics and science. And um, this, um, this whole thing of doing well continued um, when he went to Cambridge from University, both sportingly and academically, because uh, he was a Ryan Blue for Cambridge, being a number seven, and represented Cambridge three times for playing golf, and um, at one point competed in an international amateur championship, as well as doing really well in his medical studies at the same time. So um, when he graduated, uh, he was training and practicing as an ear, nose and throat surgeon pre-war, and he was really on this path of being an up-and-coming ear, nose and throat surgeon, because uh, he uh, was operating in 1913 under the prestigious surgeon Sir Milton Rees, uh, as well as doing his hospital work, contracting out to um, the Royal Opera House, doing, uh, treating laryngitis and splaying the throats of some of the most famous uh, opera singers at the time and at one case even uh, uh, removing the tonsils of one of the royals in Buckingham Palace. Um, so yeah, he, he was really on this path of, um, of just doing well in um, the, the well-established ear, nose and throat surgery. But for Gillies and for everyone else in Europe at the time, the events of 1913 to 1914 were, no, sorry, 1914 to 1918 were just around the corner. Oh yeah, and I've just chucked in this photo here because I think it's very relatable, it's just um, him like there at Cambridge, you know, I think um, if he had Facebook at the time, that would have been his profile picture. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, the Great War, uh, 19, July 1914 to November 1918. And while there was the tragedy of eight and a half million dead, uh, there was also 21 million wounded that needed to be attended to. <coughs> And um, I've got no doubt that the, the number of the dead would be much higher and the number of the wounded would be much lower if it weren't for the medical advances at the time, which saved countless lives. Uh, on all sides, they developed a medical evacuation chain, um, which um, greatly increased the speed at which um, soldiers could be taken from the front lines and um, be brought to hospitals for um, emergency surgery, and along the way receiving first aid treatment. And uh, the injuries that were being sustained in this time were caused by a massive change in military technology uh, with a really a failure in the tactics of the time to understand um, how these changes, sorry, a failure for generals at the time to, failure to understand how it would change tactics. Because you're ending up with um, like infantry charging against uh, machine gun lines for years and years on end in the, battle, in the battles of uh, the Western Front. And there was just so much more metal flying through the air, like uh, shell fragments and machine gun bullets with such a capacity to injure, and so many more people being thrown against these weapons. Um, there had been some wars in the preceding few decades, but just none had been of the scale before. And World War I in particular was dominated by trench warfare. And um, in trench warfare what happens is you're, you're standing in your trench, comes up to around here, and then you've got your gun picked up like that. So the most exposed part of the body is the face and the, the face and the jaw and the head area. And what this meant was 16% of all soldiers injured sustained facial injuries. And for the first time ever, they were actually making it home to Britain alive. Well, like making it home to wherever they came from alive. And the question was raised of what should be and what could be done in these situations. Um, what could be done for these men? <coughs> And because um, the idea of like not doing life-saving surgery but surgery for aesthetics was never really seriously appreciated through the medical establishment because I guess it just wasn't possible and um, now it was something that needed to be considered. The Germans were doing facial repair work and in fact they were doing some of the best facial repair work in Europe at the time because they had sent observers, surgical observers to the Balkans War of 1912 to 1913. The French were doing uh, facial repair work but um, on the British side, it actually took a French-American dentist um, in order to bring their uh, face and jaw surgery up to scratch. 
Um, in Sir, 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 I hope I pronounced this right, Charles uh, Valadier, um, also known as the Rolls Royce dentist. Um, Valadier was a, um, an American dentist um, who uh, trained in Philadelphia and practiced in New York. And when he wanted to um, help out the war effort, uh, America wasn't involved in World War I at the time. So um, if he wanted to go into the French army to serve, he needed to either go in as a private or to enlist in the French Foreign Legion. And um, instead he offered his uh, services to the British Red Cross, which uh, they accepted, but when he was posted to Europe, um, there was no uh, facilities for dental treatment at the time. And uh, working for the Red Cross, he wasn't receiving pay. But nevertheless, um, he decided to self-finance um, this, uh, his dental treatment, his dental practice, and bought a 1913 Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost, which is literally this one here, fitted a dental chair in the back, and traveled around uh, France uh, treating uh, dental injuries as they came up. And he really had this reputation for just being a, a remarkable schmoozer, like, um, just like um, talking and getting his way in with the highs up, and managed to use his talents to convince uh, the British Army for the necessity of a face and jewel ward, um, which um, was set up uh, a 50 year bed unit in a town just outside of Boulogne. And there um, he was doing some really uh, good facial reconstructive work for a while. But um, he was a dentist and he claimed to be medically trained, but uh, this claim was at best dubious. So um, what he decided to do, no, so the, the British um, highs up decided that um, initially, sorry, initially he was doing the repair work all by himself, but then he should be assisted by a trained surgeon. And this is where Harold Gillies comes into the picture. Uh, Gillies was 32 when uh, World War I broke out, and he um, was posted by the British Red Cross to work um, under Charles, uh, Charles Valadier. Um, uh, um, assisting him in his surgery. And it's clear that this work must have had some kind of um, effect on him and that must have been inspiration, yeah. inspirational for him at the time. And um, as well as the fact that he was given a book by a, um, a, an American dentist called Bob's Roberts, who was a friend of him. And the, we're not 100% sure what the book was, but the best evidence is that it was a book by one of these German surgeons who was doing great work uh, called uh, Linden. And the book was actually, uh, the chapter from the book was a critique of uh, what could be done better within face and jaw surgery at the time. Um, so he was inspired by this, um, so much so that when the opportunity came up for leave, he didn't uh, take it in the seaside towns of France, he instead uh, went to Paris uh, to visit the French surgeon um, Hippolyte Morstan, who um, was um, uh, in clinic at the time. Gillies visited and saw uh, uh, Morstan taking out a cancer of the face uh, and uh, taking the tissue defects and grafting new tissue into it from the neck onto the face. And um, he writes years later that this was. Um, like a key moment in his life for him. He says that he felt this was the one job in the world that he wanted to do. Uh, and he, he left the clinic and uh, by the end of 1915, he persuaded the army to set up a plastic ward at the Cambridge Military Hospital, Aldershot. And um, the, they did, they, um, they established the ward. And um, in the meantime, while it was being set up, Gillies toured France inspecting the face and jaw surgery um, that was going on at the time and just getting um, ideas and inspirations and seeing what was being done. On his way back, he stopped past the war office with a suggestion. And the suggestion was that um, all face and jaw, um, and uh, patients with face and jaw injuries uh, should be tagged with these labels, uh, directing them to the, um, the Cambridge Military Hospital. And he was laughed out of the room. So he went down to the local bookshop and uh, bought 10 pounds worth of labels, or in today's money, $2,000, New Zealand dollars, and uh, sent them to France. And within a couple of weeks, patients started arriving at Outer Shop with these labels uh, pinned on his uniforms. <laughs> so uh, here's the Cambridge Hospital itself. It was built in 1879 to fly into Nightingale specifications. And by all accounts, it seemed like a really nice place to get sick. It had these wide open corridors um, with uh, lots of sunlight and plenty of ventilation and 
I don't know my London geography that well, so what I've uh, sh shown you with this is that it's only just a 55 minute drive away from Buckingham Palace. Um, so yeah, not, not too far out of London, and if you want to go there. And um, in this hospital, Gillies, was, um, Gillies and his team were tasked with this gargantuan um, the problem ahead of them, well, like, yeah, problem of creating a new specialty. Um, he writes uh, that unlike the students of today who was weaned on um, small scar excisions and gradually graduated to a simple hair lip, uh, they were suddenly asked to produce half a face. And these early months uh, was really uh, dominated by this trial and error of earlier surgical techniques. Um, the, uh, there was a good deal of literature already out there of principles of techniques that had been developed in the previous um, few decades. But the, they were confused in their principles, and um, the, the, there was um, a lot of diagrams and um, people saying you should do this for this operation, that for that operation. Um, there wasn't a lot of evidence what was the best treatments and what actually worked. So um, he developed this system uh, of approaching a plastic case, and uh, the systematic approach which could be applied to every patient, but more so a... Um, uh, the system was interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary and collaborative. Uh, dentistry worked with surgery, with uh, sorry, surgery worked with dentistry, with nursing, with dental technology, in an environment that was really conducted to create the best outcomes for these surgical patients. This approach is what I think was the most unique aspect to Aldershot and uh, later uh, SIGCUP. Um, because it stood really in contrast to the rest of Europe. While there were some great surgeons doing work around there, uh, they weren't working with others. And um, the, the, this, I think, hindered the development of the specialty until Gillies came along. Uh, dentistry in itself was actually particularly important in the initial stages of treatment, with uh, wound cleaning and um, debridement, managing tooth fractures and managing um, fr tooth fragments and stabilizing fractures. And uh, this is best summed up with a partnership that developed between uh, Harold Gillies and William Kelsey Fry, um, who um, Kelsey Fry was posted to um, uh, Gillies' hospital, and uh, upon meeting Gillies, he remarked, I'll take the hard tissues, you take the soft. And if the lineage of plastic surgery is descended from Harold Gillies, uh, the lineage of maxillofacial surgery is descended from William Kelsey Fry and this conversation that was had. And which Max, Max Fax is a, a branch of surgery and dentistry that is focused around deformities and trauma to the bones of the face. So, I thought that was good. Cool. <laughs> um, um, the experimental nature of the surgery meant that uh, there was a lot of new problems that were encountered and Gillies and his team really needed to think creatively in order to solve them. Facial wounds are complex in themselves because of the detail of the anatomy and the rich blood supply in the area. And um, the real problem with them is that they're an area that you just can't leave um, alone to heal because we eat and we're breathing through the face. If you have a facial wound, it becomes really, really hard to put in gas while operating because the anaesthetist really tends to get in the way of the surgeon. Uh, where possible, local was used, but uh, when general was required, uh, a mask was just out of the question. So instead, uh, a tube was passed down the throat to supply anaesthetic. Uh, this was usually ether, which um, has got a reputation being a very temperamental gas to work with. And uh, this really created its own problems because uh, without the mask, um, when the gas was applied through the tube, the patient would breathe it directly into the surgeon's face. And um, this in itself uh, led to another landmark development, uh, the refinement of the endotracheal tube um, with the Irish anaesthetist Ivan McGill pioneering a two-tube system where one tube would supply the anaesthetic and then another would remove it and um, keeping the, the ether out of the face of the surgeon. Um, something that was also really important is that there were no antibiotics and there wouldn't be for another 20 years. And the soils of the battlefield were um, like really fertile in teeming with these opogenistic pathogens such as Clostridium uh, causing gas gangrene. Uh, so, infection just had to be managed with old school um, aseptic operating with um, debridement and um, nursing care, just uh, wound dressing, irrigation with saline and topical antibiotics. Uh, Gillies found that dealing with cuts and fractures wasn't too difficult in itself, 
but the problem was made much worse uh, when these bullets and shell fragments were taking large pieces of tissue out of the face. Or in his words, when, uh, when pieces were actually missing from the puzzle. And at frontline hospitals what was happening was uh, these uh, surgeons were uh, taking the edges of these large uh, wounds where there was tissue missing and bringing them together which causes like a smushing and um, it brings all the features of the face and um, around the wounds uh, towards the wound um, and this yeah this distortion of facial features and this was made much worse by the phenomenon of scar contraction if tissue is damaged to such an extent where it loses the ability to regenerate properly, um, it um, scars over. And uh, scar tissue is just kind of this good enough tissue which uh, loses um, the... Uh, it, it bridges gaps and it holds things together, but it loses the properties of the original tissue, such as um, it, um, it doesn't have sweat glands, it doesn't have hair follicles, and um, it's, it's not as strong or uh, flexible as the original tissue. And, um, and scar tissue has this property where over time it tends to contract and um, bring in things towards it. So um, this is great in small quantities because you end up with um, these lacerations. So if you have lacerations, it just brings either um, sides of the wound together and uh, makes, it, um, makes the scar go away over time. But uh, when you're dealing with um, large amounts of scar tissue, when there's... Um, huge parts of the face are torn away, or um, if you've got these extensive burns, uh, the scar contraction causes an even further distortion of um, facial features. And uh, this was the, the biggest problem that Gillies was was uh, Gillies had to tackle within his surgery. And uh, all of this was made so much harder by just the pure scale of the conflict. Um, up, up until 1916, the British hadn't really sunk their teeth into the Western Front um, in the same way that the, um, the Germans and the French had. But in the middle of 1916, the British embarked on the Somme campaign. And uh, this, the, this was basically a mass infantry offensive against the most fortified position in the German lines. One of the most fortified positions in the German lines. And it, w it was a slaughter. In the first day, there were 60,000 casualties, uh, 40,000 wounded and 20,000 dead. And Gillies actually got a phone call uh, before the offensive by the Director General of the Army Medical Services, uh, telling him to inspect, uh, expect a further 200 casualties. And in the following uh, two weeks, they received 2,000 casualties. And just like picture for yourself what that would look like if uh, Dunedin Hospital received 2,000 uh, patients requiring major trauma surgery over a period of two weeks. It would, it would be chaos. And then take that picture and then put it in the 1916 context of a single surgical ward. Um, the, the slope um, here is Gillies writing uh, 30, 40 odd years later uh, saying that let us roll up our sleeves before the work really begins now. And uh, this picture here is of Private Dix, um, who was injured on the first day of the Battle of the Somme and made his way through Gillies' hospital. And uh, it was clear that Aldershot's um, facilities weren't up to scratch, and uh, what was necess uh, necessary was a larger purpose-built hospital. And so what came about was the Queen's Hospital Sitka. And this was built to Gillies' own design, of having uh, these uh, central, <coughs> there you go, um, central um, operating theatres, and then these surgical wards that radiated outwards, and it had 320 beds plus um, uh, beds for uh, convalescence and recovery in the surrounding estates, <coughs> meaning that um, a patient could be operated on, be acutely treated within the hospital, but then sent away to um, further estates. Um, elsewhere freeing up actual hospital space and then could be brought back um, months later if they required later operations with a phone call. And this was ingenious but what was also ingenious was um, the fact that it wasn't just uh, Gillies and a British surgical team working at the hospital. There was uh, teams from all over the Dominions. There was um, a Canadian team, there was um, an Australian team and a New Zealand team each responsible for uh, treating patients from their own countries. 
And the head of the New Zealand team, in fact, was Henry Pickerel, who was the dean of the dance school that I mentioned at the start of the lecture. And uh, this environment meant that uh, surgical lessons could be uh, learned, there was learned in one area and then disseminated very quickly amongst the others. And um, was really an environment where um, there was healthy rivalry and competition between the sections, but I think this really contributed to the overall um, success of the hospital and the work that it did. The, so um, there were thousands of cases that went through Aldershot and Queen's Hospital and um, a collection of cases that came out of it were condensed and published in Gillies' 1920 book, uh, Plastic Surgery of the Fess, which I got this one here from uh, Wellington Medical Library and I've had it for the last six months if nobody else was using it. Um, so yeah, it's um, it's more of a training manual than a textbook and in it this is where um, Gillies uh, really documents his uh, systematic approach to um, a plastic case in it, um, you know, history, diagnosis, examination and um, outlines a few of the surgical principles. And I think these uh, principles are really well summed up, by, beautifully summed up in fact, by uh, the patient that I'm about to show you. So uh, this is Private Bell and um, he sustained a uh, total loss of his upper lip and part of his maxilla in France. And um, in France, um, like I said before, there was this uh, attempt to close the wound by bringing the edges of the wound together. And this resulted in this terrible contraction of his mouth and nose. Um, like, his, his mouth at this point is basically not functional. It's, uh, and um, it's, it's just really clear that he just couldn't be, remain in this condition. Um, he, the interesting note about this case is that he actually came with the letter, um, which is probably the worst example of doctor's handwriting I've ever seen. Um, it took um, me and my 30 minutes to try to get most of it translated and I couldn't do it, so I flicked an email off to Terry. And, <laughs> well, dear Gillies, I'm sending you private bell as this is a long case as you'll see. He had severe fractures of both upper and lower jaws, uh, both now united, da 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 da. He is um, a very fine chap and deserves your personal attention, and therefore I specially recommend him to you. Yours sincerely, Charles Valadier, the Rolls Royce dentist who we talked about before. So, I thought that was a nice uh, link into um, this case. And uh, what, um, what followed it is that Gillies knew that he could remain in this condition, but um, what he decided to do was a little bit controversial. Um, and he decided to reconstruct the wound and then replace the tissue defect with new tissue. And this is that being done here. And like for all intents and purposes, it looks worse. And Gillies knows that it looks worse, but he saw it as the first essential step in order to uh, reconstruct the wound. And it's the first illustration of um, one of these surgical principles that um, I've been mentioning throughout this, which is replace what is normal in normal position. And Private Bell was the first patient that this was ever applied to. Um, if, uh, Gillies figured that in order to successfully conduct a plastic operation, you needed to, um, especially in the case of trauma, you needed to move what, um, you need to move what had been moved out of place back to where it should be, and this puts you in a position to reconstruct the wound. And so what was done, the scar tissue was taken um, out around the nose and um, in between the corners of the mouth, and this allowed the nose to rise forward and the mouth to spring apart like that. And uh, now what followed was, yeah, the introduction of new tissue. And... Let's see. Oh, I've done something here. Tissue flaps. Um, so yeah, tissue can be grafted from one area of the body to another, but it requires a blood supply in order to stay alive. A new blood supply will ideally form at the recipient site, but it takes time for these new blood vessels to grow. And um, in this time while the blood vessels are growing, the tissue is really particularly vulnerable to um, infection or um, if the, the graft is bumped and damaged, it can shear off these, uh, these fledgling blood vessels and cause the, the graft to fail. Um, in the meantime, blood can be supplied to the grafted tissue by having a portion still attached to the body. And this is what is known as a flap. Uh, flaps provide consistent blood supply to move tissue and increases the chance that it will take. 
and give this a go. So in this area where we had this tissue defect, we need to um, we need to graft more tissues from it. And here um, we cut the tissue like so, leaving um, a portion of that still attached to the rest of it, and then move it to the recipient site. And this allows blood to flow longitudinally down the um, down the strip of the uh, flap of tissue uh, to the site, and then that's left for a couple of weeks until the blood vessels. Um, uh, are grown and that graft is stable and then it's detached and then the rest of it is brought back into the donor site by like that. So this principle was about to be applied to private bell. And um, I have to thank my wonderful flatmate Bridget Cody for um, doing this fantastic diagram. And um, so we've got this tissue defect here. And um, the, the, the upper lip is comprised of um, this portion that's inside the mouth, this uh, pink part which makes the, the lip itself, the kissy part, and then um, this uh, portion which is on the outer surface. So the first step was to move um, a flap of tissue out of there to create the inner lip. Um, I can't show it very well in here, but a flap from inside the mouth using the mucosa on the inside was moved to create the pink bit and then a flap was moved like that to create the outer part. So this, um, this was a six flap operation that was all done in one go. And to replace the missing part of the jaw and maxilla, uh, no, sorry, of the maxilla, um, it, this was all done over a dental prosthesis put in place by William Kelsey Fry. And now we can have a look at that through um, some of the photos from plastic surgery of the face. If I can see that particular. So um, uh, here the skin um, and tissue flats were created. And then they were brought in the middle to suture it like such. Flaps um, C and D here being the um, part from the inside of the mouth. And then this left him in the final condition like that, which I think you can appreciate as a massive improvement over his original condition. Like, and then um, over time, um, as he ages, the um, the lymphedema will um, get better and it will look a lot more um, normal as time goes on. But yeah, just I think it's fantastic for 19, 1917, 1918. And then here you can see the progress of it. Like that, and I think it's I really appreciate what was done from if you have a look at it from the side profile, and especially in that presenting condition, how um, the um, suturing the edges of the wound together had really uh, brought in his nose, and how um, doing that surgical debridement had really. Um, like w while it made the, the, the gap worse, it really brought his nose into a position for the rest of the tissue to be reconstructed around it. So if what I, I'm using these words carefully of um, describing uh, principles and techniques because principles stay the same over time while uh, techniques changed. And what I just illustrated before was um, the, um, the principle of um, retain a normal position, tissue in normal position, and then the second principle here of losses must be replaced in kinds. So those are principles, but um, the principles are put in place and guide surgical techniques. And this was a surgical technique that Gillies um, really uh, pioneered, which expanded the scope of plastic surgery massively. So he noticed that when a flat was made, uh, the tissue tended to curl at the edges longitudinally. Uh, like such. And then he noted that suturing the edges into a tube um, meant that there was a, a consistent amount of skin all the way around which um, was much more resistant to infection and drying out. And so uh, these tubes could be moved to and from almost anywhere on the body. Um, you could have a tube, um, a pedicle uh, starting from the leg, suture it to the chest and then wait for the graft to take on the chest 
detach the, uh, the leg part and then move it onto the face. And um, you and it greatly increased the scope um, and the success rate of tissue grafting. And um, here's this being put into place. Again, the diagram from plastic surgery of the face. The original defect here, a flap being created, stitched into a tube, swung into position, sutured into place, and then once it had been taken, the, the stalk can uh, be unrolled and you get most of the tissue that was in the recipient site back, in the donor site back. And this here is uh, Private William Vicarage, who um, was the first person um, that Gillies ever used this technique on. And he had these horrific burns uh, from a magazine explosion um, f uh, f uh, while he was on a warship in the Battle of Jutland. And it left him with a massive amount of the scar tissue all over his face, complete destruction of his nose and lips and eyelids. And so um, a massive uh, skin flap was taken out from his chest, put onto his face, and, um, and the, the blood supply to this was supported by two pedicles on either side. And once the flap had taken, um, the pedicles were divided, and then you had this extra pedicle tissue which could be used for whatever you wanted. So uh, the left pedicle was used to remake the nose, and the right pedicle was used to reconstruct some of the cheek. Um, after his, uh, World War I, um, Gillies was out of job because um, the, um, all of the plastic cases had been treated and he needed to decide what to do with his future. And this left him with um, yeah, a doubtful future in peacetime. These, after World War I, um, he had uh, two paths open to him of um, becoming an assistant surgeon at St. Bartholomew's Hospital, doing general surgery, um, or being a chief assistant at the ear, nose and throat department at Bath's with the responsibility of treating plastic cases, any of the plastic cases that were available to the hospital. And um, in this first position as assistant surgeon, um, that would, it was by far the more prestigious one but it left him with no opportunity to further his art. And he, at, by this point, he really considered an art form in that um, um, I, I took the name for this lecture, Surgery Calls Art from Its Aid, uh, Surgery Calls Art to Its Aid, as a direct quote from um, his book, Plastic Surgery of the Face. And he writes um, that he refused the general surgery position, thinking perhaps rightly that if he stuck to plastic surgery, he could do more work for the art in the long run than if I developed it as a side issue. And so um, he, he went down that route, and this kind of been an easy decision for him, as there was no precedent at this time for plastic surgery. Um, but uh, there, was no, um, there were no training positions, there was no governing bodies, and he was really left with um, an, an uncertain path. But as the 1930s, um, 1920s progressed and progressed into the 1930s, there was this post-war boom in industry which really began to um, provide gillies with cases because uh, the factories were reopening and their, um, the factories were reopening and um, people were getting injured in factories and um, the public was getting moving as automobiles really took off and getting into car accidents. And, um, the, he didn't, and this allowed Gillies to take his uh, wartime um, principles and apply them in a civilian context, um, as well as cosmetic surgery came along. I think cosmetic surgery is a bit of a contentious issue these days, or like it's a little bit controversial, and you can imagine how it would have been back in the 1930s. But uh, Gillies, uh, he would do the operation, and um, he would do the operation if he felt that it made the patient happy. Um, which I think is a really cool approach uh, to bring to it. And um, he made as a side note that if he was tossing up whether an operation was necessary, um, he would, um, if the patient walked in his room and he couldn't take his eyes off their nose, then it was probably a good idea. Um, so um, Gillies then, um, as it comes into the 1930s, um, he is one of the most uh, busiest surgeons in London. And um, he uh, can't keep up with the workload, so he partners with um, a former surgeon from Sitka, uh, T. Kilner, and trained up the Kiwis that I mentioned at the start, uh, Mackendo and Melbourne, throughout the 1930s. And uh, by the time um, uh, World, War I, World War II came around, uh, these uh, surgeons became the big four. 
uh, the, the only four full-time plastic surgeons operating in the UK. And this is because there was a real reluctance to the medical profession in the UK, despite the demand to embrace plastic surgery. Um, interestingly enough, in America, um, in part probably thanks to Gillies' lecture tour that he did over there just after the war, uh, 60 plastic surgeons have been trained um, in the same time period, but only two on the British front. Um, World War II came along and um, the, the British Army learned from World War I and immediately set up these plastic um, and maxillary facial units. So Gillies went to Rooksdown House, which is um, another mansion just outside uh, London, and um, which was retrofitted into a surgical hospital. Uh, Mackendo went to the now very famous, um, uh, or now a household name, but depending on the household, uh, Queen Victoria Hospital, uh, where he uh, established, where his patients established the guinea pig club. And uh, Mal went to Helen Hospital, where he was doing some of the early pioneering work behind antibiotics. Uh, in Gillies' capacity, he treated casualties um, from all sorts of contexts, from um, Dunkirk, civilian um, casualties from, from the Blitz, uh, casualties from North Africa, from the Middle East, from Italy, all throughout the World War II. And um, the fact that he was doing um, uh, civilian and um, British soldiers and even German POWs meant that he probably didn't get the, this is why he's not as much of a household name these days as Mackendoe is because uh, Mackendoe uh, was um, in his capacity at Queen Victoria was only operating on RF pilots who were the celebrities of the war period and then after the war they were the ones who wrote the books and um, kind of brought Mackendoe into um, yeah being a household name Whereas that's, uh, Gillies' is less prominent um, patients is probably a reason why I felt the need to come along and do this talk today. Um, later in Gillies' career, um, well, like after World War II, uh, he was short of money and uh, couldn't retire. Um, he was famous for never really um, knowing how much was in his bank account at the time. And um, so he needed to continue to find work. And one community who's probably pretty thankful for this is the transgender community, because uh, in 1946 he did the first male to female gender reassignment surgery, and in uh, 1951 did the first female to male gender reassignment surgery. And um, he became the first uh, president of British Plastic Association in 1946, and then um, afterwards became this um, elder, like roving elder spokesperson, elder statesman for plastic surgery, giving lectures and doing operations all around the world, um, including uh, two in New Zealand in 1956, which he said was one of the two reasons he's went. And the other reason was that he wanted to smell the New Zealand bush on a wet day. He wanted to hear the tui, catch a brown trout, do a little painting, and perhaps play three or four holes of golf. And he wanted to see if the hood of car was in full bloom. Which, yeah, I thought was nice. Um, it was his um, only visit to New Zealand after leaving uh, for um, leaving for Cambridge that many years before. Um, and then in 1957, he published his book, uh, The Principles and Art of Plastic Surgery. And um, he writes that these principles do not apply not merely to plastic surgery, but to life. And this book is um, an autobi it's an autobiographical textbook where he talks um, uh, about his work over the years and introduce introduces these uh, principles that um, he's acquired over his career in plastic surgery. Stuff like um, observation is the basis of surgical diagnosis. That the best training for a physician, uh, for a surgeon, is to learn observation by a physician. Uh, these two principles that we talked about um, with the case before. Replace what is normal in normal position and retain it there and that losses must be replaced in kind. And um, just nice stuff like do something positive, um, the aftercare is important as in the planning, and then finally my favourite, never do it today what can be honourably put off until tomorrow, which sums up my prep for this lecture quite well. Um, so Gillies' legacy um, lies in um, these, in, in essentially what plastic surgery is today. Um, the techniques have progressed massively since Gillies' time, and in particular this uh, thing called microsurgery, which is what uh, rendered ultimately the tube pedicle largely obsolete, except in situations where you don't have a microscope available to you, um, such as actually combat in the Afghanistan war. Um, 
Microsurgery is where instead of waiting for the new blood vessels to grow to add the new tissue, um, it's uh, to grow to the um, the donor tissue at the recipient site. You just attach them yourself by hand, and these blood vessels can be as small as one millimeter. So, and then you can see right there, just vaguely, is the size of a microsurgical needle. And then these operations, like given by the name, are done under a microscope. So this is um, a blood vessel being sutured, an artery to an artery being sutured right here. And it's um, so microsurgery um, rendered the tube pedicle obsolete. And then um, these ideas, craniofacial surgery, tissue expansion, distraction osteogenesis, all have their roots and uh, techniques that were developed in SIDCA and are a progression from those. But the important thing is that uh, while these techniques have changed, the principles remain unchanged. Those 16 principles of plastic surgery developed in the interwar period, in uh, World War I, are written about in his 1950s book, are just as relevant to the modern surgeon today as they were uh, back then. And the thing that I, I really wanted to talk about, and um, I'm just going to have to show it in the end here, is that like with all of this, um, he still um, preserved his personality um, while, um, while embarking on this career in surgery. He had this remarkable distaste for um, anything serious, and um, like it, it, it's, it might have compromised his career in some cases because um, uh, he was passed over for the admission to um, uh, the, um, being on the Council of the Royal College of Surgeons. But he um, did stuff like um, he would turn up to these dinners that were being hosted in his honour, and then um, when the he was the where he was the guest of honour, and then when the host was about to toast to, uh, to his health, he would duck under the table so everybody else would be looking for him. <laughs> he um, turned up to like countless um, surgical conferences and important stuff in disguise just because he thought it was funny. Um, he um, there's this really famous, uh, well not famous, but a story that I like of a house surgeon coming along to um, a, an interview with Gillies and uh, waiting in the waiting room um, because um, just waiting for his job interview. And um, Gillies, no, sorry, a, a janitor uh, walks up to him, uh, mopping the floors, and starts asking him um, questions about his life. And he's an old man with white hair and um, starts asking him about. Um, what his hobbies were, um, his his golfing record, and like where he trained, grew up, and all that kind of stuff. And then um, the the house surgeon was getting a bit frustrated and just being curt with him. But then eventually um, the janitor thanked him for his um, time and left. And then um, he gets called into his interview, and then he was told that he was interviewed in the hallway by Gillies. <laughs> I just just I oh know it was just things like that during the biography that really jumped out to me as. Something that I wanted to give back. Anyway, um, I just want to say thank you very much for your time. Um, this has been a really cool opportunity for me, and um, I just want to thank um, Terry Doyle for giving me the opportunity to do this lecture. I want to thank my uncle Joe Ginty for um, lending me the book. I want to thank Colonel Daryl Tong for helping me um, understand some of these cases and get my head around plastic surgery, and just thank all of you guys for coming along. So, cheers. Uh, like no, it's a it's a story that it's it's related to it because yeah, Mackendo was um, Gillies's um, younger first cousin once removed. I think there's about twenty years difference, and uh, <coughs> Mackendo um, uh, May was looking for a job um, in the early 1930s because he'd come over to UK, uh, the UK uh, for a job that actually didn't exist. So he was broke out on his ass. And he made contact with Gillies, who um, he knew was a cousin, but had never actually met. And um, Gillies um, wrote a positive letter of recommendation for him, and got him the job. Um, got him a job as an anatomy demonstrator. Then eventually trained him up um, over the 1930s as a surgeon under him. 
And then, um, yeah, Mackenzo uh, in the 1940s um, went and did the work on the RAF pilots and famous for the surgical work that he was doing, but also uh, with the guinea pig club. Um, his patients um, just um, <coughs> called themselves the guinea pig club because um, there was a really strong sense of community that Mackenzo fostered within um, that hospital of East Grinstead. And they were called the guinea pig club because they had, of the experimental nature of the surgery that was going on with them. And were they mostly RAF people? The, the entirely RAF pilots. And I think that is what brought together their sense of community because it was just they'd all shared the same experience. Whereas in Gillies' context, um, it was more of like a haphazard grouping of people that there was like um, a Rooksdown club, but it never really got the same famousness as the guinea pig club did. Um, they could take up to years, and um, I think that the, um, that case in particular took over a year. But um, what is is really important to consider is the fact that um, there, um, in between these operations, they were really otherwise healthy people. Um, like with with um, yeah, with having had major surgery done to them, but like they'd be waiting for months and months at a time. And especially at original hospital in Aldershot, just waiting in bed, they wouldn't be allowed to leave um, just due to army regulations and all that kind of stuff. And um, just waiting for the next operation. So like, think what it would be like to be in a hospital for a year, or two years, or three years, in some cases, several years. So how many cases would we do in that The thousands. And uh, that book there has got um, a collection of 500, of 500 or so of the cases. Oh no, it doesn't have 500 cases in it, but the numbers go up to like 500 and stuff. Um, and I think in total in SIDCUP, there were over 8,000 patients treated through there. What was the difference in terms of what Gillies was doing in the First World War and Second World War? So what kind of changes in his approach or to the injuries or to, to the reconstruction that he was doing? Um, that was an awesome question, and um, it was one of the things I was going to put in the lecture, but ran out of time. So I didn't. I haven't researched this that well, but um, th I think there was um, really a difference in the, um, I, I guess, like the swiftness of like um, how quickly he was receiving the cases, because like um, people could um, turn up in like a really pretty sh um, shoddy gangrenous condition from like the Western France in World War One and then ends up at um, Sidcup with j just in, in a really rough state. Whereas if he was treating casualties from like the Battle of Britain, for example, they would be probably in a lot better medically more stable condition when they reached there. Um, yeah, um, I don't know if his principles and techniques really changed and advanced that much, um, apart from just a refinement of the earlier surgical stuff. Um, like uh, the um, antibiotics were just coming out at the time and Malin did a lot of research into that but I don't know if they were employed as much in, um, in Gillies' work. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Thank you. Research done here. Cheers, thank you. Uh, just as an aside, I started my career with another branch of the John Magno family and was with them for many years. So obviously, when through the family, this um, quest for trying different things, for finding out yep. different things, uh, and it's remarkable how long that type of surgery has, has remained. Yeah. <laughs> so it must have been well ahead of its time, at the time. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Thanks for that. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that was wonderful. Oh, sorry. Here we are. <coughs> well, can I just ask you a personal question? Absolutely. I mean, has this influenced you enough to make you want to become a plastic surgeon yourself? <laughs> um, I, I think if I went into surgery, like this is, I think plastic surgery is so cool. Uh, and I, it was a topic that I never knew anything about until I stumbled across this and started coming into it. But um, yeah, I, I, I don't know if I'm going to be a surgeon. But if I did, it would be my top choice, I think. Thank you.
Did he give any more details for the, the reasoning behind his principle that it was best to not do today what could be honourably put <laughs> off? Um, I think it's um, illustrated pretty well with um, one of um, his cases that's in the book and probably the, the, the most, like, the roughest case that you can probably see in there, which was a patient that had complete uh, burns all over the face and just um, destroyed most of his, like, facial tissue, just replaced with scarred, like, much worse than what I saw, you saw with um, the able semen vicarage with the two pedicles. And um, the, the patient was really, really eager to get it done within um, a very short space of time. And um, in that process, they tried to graft far too much tissue with not enough blood supply supporting it. And um, it just caused um, massive infection, sepsis, the graft to fail, and the patient later died. And um, he wrote of it as like one of his like his biggest mistakes that he made during the time. But like the lesson could be learned from it. Of yeah, not um, not being too hasty with that surgery. Arthur Gillies had a favourite party trick. Was you probably read about it where he would uh, tee a ball up on a beer bottle and yep. drive a straight a couple of hundred yards down the fairway. It was easy. Yeah, absolutely. He had a um, he had a dodgy arm, uh, yes. um, but it didn't uh, hinder him in his golfing. He just had to play off the high tee, right. and he eventually switched over to a rubber tee because uh, the beer bottles kept breaking and the groundskeepers kept complaining. <laughs> and go, like I've after reading his biography, I never realised how serious golf was, and um, everybody got <laughs> everybody got very offended at the fact that he was teeing off such a high tee and thought it was unacceptable for like action, unacceptable for somebody to do that. So yeah. <laughs> Uh, my name is McIntyre as well, oh, and I nice uh, <coughs> was in the, under training in, the, in England with the Royal Navy right. for a number of years, and I stayed with my uncle uh, at East Grimstead. Really? And um, I was allowed uh, for a pretty free go at the hospital, including the records of the colour photography. Wow. Uh, but the thing that I did notice in the hospital was the extreme attractiveness of the nurses. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very, most interesting, the, these badly disfigured men who were very well patched up, of course, but still badly disfigured, right. they married these beautiful women. Wow. <laughs> no trouble at all. <laughs> it's probably the reason why the hospital is so highly rated. <laughs> <laughs> so famous. Oh, uh, thank you very much for coming along. It means so much. Okay, well, Arthur, thank you very much indeed. This has just been a wonderful presentation, and uh, Arthur is uh, its a name to watch for the future, I'm sure. <laughs> thank you very much indeed.